environment, uh, in a garage, uh, laboratory workshop, uh, homemade everything. This coil produced 60% greater output of the magnetic inductance. Um, it was made by Bill Ramsey. Um, using these coils... Who's Bill um, Ramsey? He was introduced to me, um, I guess, in the early 92, 93, 94. Mm -hmm. And he was the only one at that time that I was willing to volunteer to take my schematics and blueprints as best he could approximate and make this coil mm -hmm. that was wound in a completely different way than conventional electrical coils. So the way they wind the copper for the coil was different. Right. Okay. And we'll get more into that later, no doubt. Okay. And so if this coil was applied to motors, to different things, um, I actually believe that I'm able to harness an energy that's never been seen before. And I have endorsements from the peer review from the different experts in the field saying that I've done just that. Yeah, I, I literally claim that I can obsolete petroleum, that I can obsolete nuclear power. And I, I, I shudder when we use the term nuclear power because it's a charade because nuclear power isn't nuclear. Every um, nuclear reactor in the world is just a, um, a, a, a teapot. It's just used to boil water to create steam. Right through the heat. Right. And um, so what I'm able to do is I'm able to, I've literally found an energy at the source of the nucleus of every atom that it, to quote one of the, um, he was the laser optics whiz kid of General Dynamics, the biggest weapons manufacturer in the world at the time. He said, his name was Tom Dawson, he said, I had discovered the source of the non-decaying spin of the electron. I have found an energy that is linear, that goes in a straight line, that doesn't bend, is irresistible, penetrates everything. It's the source of all motion, vibration, and time. And I can see it. And that's what makes my discovery so profound, is because there's nothing out there today that explains or can observe why everything curves and warps. Right, and the mathematics that you've come up with do exactly that. Right. All right, and we're going to talk about that as we, as we get further into the program. All right, so let's back up just a minute here, okay? Sure. We have not, not only uh, Russell Blake, but we've got other people that you've been working with for a long, long time. Some of this stuff goes back. Uh, the most early uh, report that I read about you was 1989, and that was the, there were some biological implications that had to do with a doctor or an oncologist in Germany, maybe. Dr. Hans Nieper. Okay, tell us about that, because that was 17 years ago. So you've obviously been working on this stuff for a long, long time. The Begin first with, place that I ever published um, was in 1988 okay. at Airspace America. It was the United States... Big Aerospace oh, Conference. The biggest in the history of the U.S. Yes, I remember. You do? Yeah. I've been interested in this stuff for a long time, and I was sort of a big UFO buff even as I was a teenager, and I followed the aerospace uh, developments and, and the industry and the news pretty closely. But at, at any rate, tell us about Very it. Very few people remember it. Um, well, I, I was selected, to, in charge of the presentations was defense, was the editor, James Martin, the editor of Defense Science Magazine. Mm -hmm. um, my paper was titled, Low Cost Propulsion Based Upon the Reevaluation of the Physics of Matter. Um, he, he hosted me, he was very kind, he put me under the topic of power and, propel, power and propulsion systems, which is the heart of aerospace. Damn right it is. Um, so that was the first. Uh, without me going too deep into that at this moment. In 1989, I wanted my work to be applied um, to medicine. And I was able to jump from one category topic to another because um, and it, actually one of the hardest discoveries I ever made was in, in that topic of medicine. I published in the biggest genetic engineering conference in the world. It was called International Biotechnological Exposition in San Mateo. Um, they were kind enough to let me do a poster presentation at their conference, and they published me in their proceedings. Mm -hmm. um, what You mentioned Rupert Sheldrick at the opening. I love evening. Rupert. Well, Rupert postulates the existence of what is referred to as a morphogenetic field. Mm -hmm. Am I saying it correctly? Morphogenetic. Yeah, the morphogenetic field, exactly. Okay. I can see it, I know where it is, and I can harness it. And for people out there who, who, want a, who want a quick nutshell description of that, what Rupert basically argues is that organisms, uh, biology in general, has sort of a genetic memory and that uh, traits, genes, 
and uh, many, many different things that are characteristics of all these different species are literally inherited along a, a sort of uh, a resonant field that exists outside of space-time. Maybe, uh, uh, you know, we could talk about Bell non-locality or something like that, but maybe that's not worth getting into. It isn't into, even but. that hard, but that's exactly right. It's, not, it's an invisible higher-dimensional flux field. Right, okay. Um, so any, okay, so continue with uh, your comments about Rupert. Well, so he's noted as one of these um, predictors of that. There was just um, in the courts, and they lost the battle. Um, the topic was intelligent design. Huh, yeah. Um, Lots of talk about that all over the country right now. Uh, another term for either morphogenetic field or intelligent design is also bioetheric template. Etheric is spelled um, A-E-T-H-E-R-I-C. Okay. Um, Bioetheric template. Yeah. Okay. So using this map that I've discovered, I'm able to see inside the major groove of DNA. Um, in fact, when I initially made the discovery, I went to um, the University of California um, in La Jolla, San Diego, California. Mm -hmm. um, it took like six months for the person there to, it was a, to meet with me. He was their new technology transfer specialist. And I shared it with him my discoveries on DNA that the major groove of DNA is not hollow or empty. <laughs> um, and what do they say? Nature abhors a vacuum? That's it. <laughs> well, not only is there a higher dimensional flux field in DNA, but it controls...